Great, good to see you. It's great to have you with us. I'm going to hand straight over to Sweetlin. And I've got your song ready whenever you need it, Sweetlin. Thank you, Ben. Be still and know that I am God. Uh, from Psalm 46, 10, it says, this is one of many verses which God speaks directly to his people. But this one particularly speaks to me when I'm going through difficult times in my life, when my faith is tested, and when I am under spiritual conflict. The universal question arises within me, why? Why me, God? This verse helps me to unpack everything about myself and surrendering in the presence of God, to reflect in that stillness who I am and what God has set before me, to understanding the need of an ever deeper relationship with God, letting go of the baggage, having an absolute confidence in knowledge and wisdom, having blind faith in our creator, <laughs> trusting and <laughs> sorry about that, my dogs <laughs> depending and trusting and resting on his regenerative power and untroubled by it all in God, <laughs> being patient with God. So I chose a song called Still. When I first heard this, I was in tears and I was listening to this numerous times. This speaks of the awesome power of God in the stillness. So shall we listen to this?
Thank you for your awesome power in our life. Help us to rest on your power, your wisdom, your knowledge. Lord, cover us with your mighty power of love and mercy. Lead us and guide us and help us, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Amen. Oh, Thanks so much, sweet Lynn. I've not heard that for years, that song. It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, so welcome to tonight, guys. It, John's going to do a, a quick recap in a moment or two, but I just want to welcome if we've not if you've not seen him yet, uh, Wale. Wale is here somewhere. Give us a wave, Wale. It's great to have you with us, mate. And um, he's going to do our animate talk, uh, talk on building a core team in a church plant. So really looking forward to hearing from you, mate. It's so good to have you. Um, and really, that's all we're doing tonight. We're going to do. John's going to do his recap. We'll go into breakout rooms as we always do. Answer some of those questions that were sent out to you. Um, and then we'll have some Q&A on recruiting a core team. That's the step we're up to at the moment. A um, bit of a comfort break. And then Wally will speak to us. And then again, back into breakout rooms, responding to what he's shared with us and some action planning. Remember, that's always the key, that re action planning. And then we'll close up with some, some prayer and worship. So, John, over to you. Yeah, um, to those of you who are waving back at Wale, that was not a good thing to do because it was like it, literally like a game of where's Wale, you know, because everyone's waving. I found it eventually. Thanks, mate. Um, so um, this is kind of like a 10-minute recap. Um, I can share, can't I? Do I have sharing rights? You do, yeah. Okay. Right, so rather look at my face, which is not what I'm sure anyone wants to do. You can have a look at these. Um, so I really hope that you've had a chance to read that stuff. There's something there on a diverse team, building a diverse team, and just some stuff, um, some stuff on building a team in general. Um, and I guess one of the things that we say there is that um, building a team is, is a pretty scary moment. Because, you know, up until this point, you've been able to sort of go with your vision and listen to the Lord and think, you know, yes, God, where do you want to send me? And then when you're building a team, it's not just the Lord who's talking back. It's a bunch of other human beings. It's like, really? <laughs> I don't get it. I'm sorry, I don't get it. No, I'm not going to do that. You know, so it's pretty scary that your call is kind of being tested by, by other people as well. And what you'll notice in Antioch is that this, this idea of uh, building, recruiting a team, it's not that obvious. So um, very often when people are planning churches, they actually recruit a whole church. 
Well, like HDB, they'll recruit 100 plus people for you, or, or, or typically plant, they're planting, they'll plant 30 people. But you recruit a church, not a team. Um, in fact, the first read course had pretty much people, like half of the church on it. And then there are some people who are just like so apostolic, they'll just go out and do their thing. Whereas we in Antioch tend to, I don't know why, but partly because we think it works, partly because of the influence of um, missions that we were involved in, like the Eden Network or Frontiers, things like that. We build teams and then we plant away from teams, which as you'll see, has got its pluses and some of its difficulties. So um, with every team, with everything that you're doing, there, there's a double call. There's, there's a call to purpose, which you can see there with a great commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching to obey everything I've commanded you, and I will be with you to the, to the end of the age. Um, but then there's also this call to community. You can see that here from John 17. As Jesus prays, he says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be sanctified, speaking of his apostles. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. Um, so what you can see is there's both purpose of being sent into the world and there's a community. So that the community of the Father and the Son is spread out to the community between us and the Father and the Son and then between us as, as a as church and as team. So what we're doing when we're recruiting teams, we've got both the call to purpose and the call to community. And getting those things in balance and making sure that we're delivering the things at the right time is really important. And that's why this comes now, because we know that you're called to leadership. We know that you, you know where you're going. You've got a good idea of, of, of where you're heading to. You've been trained. You're, you can articulate your vision. And now you're calling other people into God's kingdom purpose. And you're calling people into this community. Um, so let me just let me just go back there. I think it's really important at this stage that you don't front up with a call to community. I'm just going to say that again. Front up with a call to purpose, and then give people a community. Because if you front up with a call community, a call to community, and say you know come to us and we're going to love you, you're going to get a lot of needy people who maybe aren't ready for that high kingdom purpose. So build your community around your purpose at this stage. Talk, think, purpose. Eventually, as your church comes into being, like community is going to come to the fore. But right now at this stage, keep it very purposeful. Know your purpose, talk your purpose, talk your call. So just a couple of things. Um, just practically, here's one. It's like, where are you going to find people? This is one of the really scary things. Where am I going to find? It's like it can seem impossible. Um, so these are some practical things that we talk about. So Ben and I have been reflecting recently. Actually, so many of the things that we see, people coming into the network, these are these are relationships that have built over the over years. So stay with the network. I mean, I'm aware that on the diverse side. Some of like it, the core of the Cheatham Hill Church plant is through a relationship with someone I knew when uh, in 1999. Admittedly, they were six years old at the time. Um, and that worked its way all the way back to a uh, the core of a church plant team. It's a very deep network. There's people you meet and encourage, but just on the ground, people who kind of get you. But again, don't call people primarily to you. I've seen a number of pretty damaged teams where people join the team wanting to be mates with the team leader, and it, it won't 
it won't sustain you. So meet and encourage them around purpose. We talk about borrowing people. I hope you've seen that in the document. That is where people are not going to journey with you long term. Can be a good thing to do. Creates a sugar shock. And believe you me, sometimes when you're planting, you need a sugar shock. But you've got to know that it's not sustainable. Movement, people are moving in and out all the time. Just keep your ear to the ground. Missions movements, just anchoring those into church. Again, it's something that Ben and I work on with people like Frontiers and you. We're constantly talking about how can we join mission to church. And the other thing is local people, really some of the best people from your team, are, are they just going to be there around. Um, if you rock up to a place and say, we have this vision for this place, and somebody who lives there says, yeah, <laughs> you are. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. That means you may have got something wrong. So local people are super important. It's not all about, as we'll see, it's not all about having kind of brilliant heroes coming in to save the place. That's not really what we're about. In the end, we always want to be a movement of local people. So look for them early. Um, and actually get out there, do stuff, get your hands dirty and show people that you care. Um, so here's some do's and don'ts in my last slide. Be clear. Tell people what you're doing. I, sometimes I meet people and say, so what are you doing in South Manchester? It's like, I just think what the Lord wants is like, you've been sent here to plant a church, haven't you? Well, it's like, well, look, if you've been sent here to plant a church, just tell us. Tell us. Don't say, I'm just here listening to the Lord. When you know, you know why you came here. Tell people, tell people what you're doing. When you're trying to recruit a team, always work in the, the interests of the person you're trying to recruit. You've got to be able to see why it will actually help that person to join your team. And if fundamentally it wouldn't, don't recruit them. Show a little bit of emotional integrity here. There might be another team they can join better, but, but just, and this is the other thing, I give people the way. Like, we want to be generous and Jesus-centered and say, Okay, it might be tough, but I'm not just gonna I'm not just gonna grab everyone I see because I'm panicked about not having a team and I've got this kind of Excel worksheet with my time-bound goals in it. If I don't reach them, I'm you know, I'm gonna be shamed or fired or something. No, just be generous, trust the Lord. And then the other thing is just pray. Because as you might be able to see in the background, it's about sending workers into the harvest, the Lord of the harvest. He wants to do it. A bit like receiving the Holy Spirit. It's a no, it's a prayer that he's told you to pray. So we must be ready to answer it logically. Here's a few don'ts on the other side. The don'ts are on the right, by the way, and the do's are on the left, just in case you were confused. In my original PowerPoint, this was a flat one with the do that was clearer. Anyway, don'ts are on the right, people, just so as you know. I said, don't call people to yourself. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. It's, it, it's got to be about God's high purpose. Don't exclude people or set the bar too high. Um, <laughs> there was once <coughs> when we first started recruiting the Longside team, I thought, well, I'll call in a bit of help from, I'm going to name the church, it was Platt. And they've got a database of where everybody lives. So I said, well, look, can I email the people within these postcodes? And they said, yeah, okay. One person, one person replied, and they started coming along to our team meeting. And, you know, their life was pretty rough. They were working, you know, a husband, wife, well, he was drinking and, and, you know, a lot of health issues. And, and, and the vicar, bless him, got talked and said, yeah, it, it might just be a bit too much for you right now. Don't do that. It's like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. That was great. Um, and it was, it was almost because he felt that, well, it would be too tough for him. We're not looking for heroes. There's a guy who has been absolutely fundamental to our long site church plant team, who has been sectioned. He's been sectioned. And I, like, I know his dad, he's a young adult, and his dad was like, you're going to be careful with this guy. It's like, he's thrived. He's thrived. Don't exclude people or set the bar too high just because you don't, you know, drop the hero thing. There's probably some amazing people. Again, if it's in their interest, just get them. Um, it's a, I mean, don't ignore people. And this is a bit sometimes where I think uh, race can come into play. Race, race and culture. It's like I'm here to recruit a team and we'll tend to like look and think that the team's going to be like you. 
Well, what about that? What about that Roma woman who, you know, Latvia, who's, you know, she just knows a lot of people and, 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 and she prays constantly and she's pretty interested in what you're doing. He's like, well, you're not keen because your English is very good. I'm like, well, are they not keen because their English isn't very good? Are they not keen because they come from Eastern Europe or, you know, somewhere that isn't you? Just don't, just don't ignore people because some amazing people are right there around you. Don't, and this is one, feed off disaffection. It's like, I'm so excited to be part of your team because I believe that you will release me into my gifts. It's like, be careful, be careful. My last pastor didn't understand me. Be careful, be careful. It's like I say to my, you know, it's like I say to my son, you know, about getting married. It's like, look, if everyone she's hung out with before you was a joke, it's just a matter of time before you are. So just avoid that one. I tell him. It's pretty much the same with recruiting people onto your church plant team. It's like there's failed church relationships and it's about disaffection and you're the brilliant new best thing. I would just avoid that because you're not. Um, and here's a final thing that we use, in, across, and up. That's generally the way we recruit people into church as well as team. So in, if they're, you know, part of a fundamentally friendly church, there's nothing much wrong with it. The just, uh, uh, sorry, that's a cross. Let me start again. In, if they're not part of a church and they're stepping into a congregation, it's legitimate to recruit them because they're not really. Now, you've got to be careful that this is, in fact, true. You know, you don't want to sort of recruit somebody who's actually they are part of the church. But look, in, across, across the road, you know, if you plant a church right across the road from them and they're actually going to a church four miles away, it's legitimate to talk to them and the pastor and say, look, could we just encourage this person to be a bit more local? That's legit. And sometimes that can be within a network. You know, there's a very strong discipling orientation about uh, a network of people and it just works for them. That up, up is greater responsibility. So you always want to make sure that generally whenever you're recruiting someone that they're, they're in, you know, that maybe they're, they're not part of the church. They're coming somewhere much nearer or they're stepping up in responsibility. So that's my little summary. Hope that helps. There's a lot, a lot more in the documents. Please read the documents. We are pouring our hearts out sometimes into these documents and worrying that, that our love and affection and passion is going unnoticed. Um, so please read the documents. And I'm going to hand back over to Ben. Um, to uh, or Pete or whoever's doing the breakout rooms. Um, Thank you, Joe. Pete, do you want to stick us straight into breakout rooms? We'll we'll come back at um, let's say quarter past eight. John, let's should we just take some questions? Any questions that you've got? Anything to do with recruiting team? Um, we've got. We've got about 10 minutes before we're gonna we're gonna break. Um so anyone got anything? Just unmute yourself. Uh hi Ben. Uh, maybe we just want to clarify whether the team gatherer is the same as the leader. Yeah, that's an excellent point, actually. Um and actually it was in my note, is that <clears throat> the key thing about a team leader and also a church leader. So they have to be safe. They've got to be like an emotionally safe person. Now, there are actually some brilliant recruiters and visionaries here. So the, the team that Jason and I work with in Africa, the guy's a brilliant recruiter and a brilliant visionary. He was unsafe. He was emotionally unsafe. So really what he should have done is something they've drifted towards, which is recruiting, envisioning, but not actually leading the team. Now, if you're fortunate enough to find a person who really kind of has the gifts to do that and you're prepared to hand over responsibility for leadership early on, you go, do that. So basically, not necessarily, but finding someone like early on that you can just give that kind of responsibility to is a, is a real plus if it happens. 
this is the critical step we me and john would agree and i think anyone would agree like your, your church plant stands or fall on the, on this step you are not going to do it on your own the the church planting graveyard is littered with folks who've done it on their own and the, the interestingly in manchester I don't, I don't know if you've got any more statistics john but manchester is a graveyard of church plants and we're not having that are we <laughs> No, I mean, we're not. I mean, we're, and actually, well, we're going to come on to why that is. It's particularly church planting among the poor can be really draining. Um, yeah. But there's actually quite a subtle transition when, when you go into church that you don't try, you don't just try burning people out and doing them one day. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the reasons why. But I mean, was there anything, I guess, in the whole process of um, team recruitment? I mean, was anyone... That idea of uncomfortable idea of like, how are we going to do it? How are we going to sell it? You know, um, was, it, was there anything in that of the kind of how to questions? I, I, I just think it's hard. And I know like we've, I've, I know there's some people that are like, they'll go around and they'll be like, come and join our team, come and join our team. And you're right, John, about like, selling it to people I think I've always felt also a bit like I want people to cop to join our team because they because God's really called them to be there and not because we've kind of really sold it to them but I think I felt a bit challenged on that as well over the last few months and years um not to be so silly just to just say mm -hmm. it just ask people and just say, look, we'd love you. We'd love you to come or, or whatever. I suppose what I'm just saying is that it's not easy, is it, all the time? And sometimes it can be about personality, can't it? Which is why Jason said it in our group as well, what was just said about how, you know, sometimes the gatherers aren't the same as the people leading it. And, yeah, that's it. For, that's, that's all I have to say, really. That's helpful. If people, are, if others are sat thinking, oh well, is there a, is there a one answer, <coughs> or it's, it is hard, or but Ben uh, said something um, at the Antioch one, well, I think it was Ben said it that I made a note of um, about asking people to pray, um, and I, I was thinking that I, I want to get myself a little prayer group to surround us, so I was going to send out some emails saying. Um, would you like to be a part of a little group praying for Emmanuel community? And here's a few things we'd like prayer for and put on it um, to gather the team. And then hopefully if God's calling, I mean, the, the people I've already spoken to about it and left it with them. But I thought the people who sort of loosely connected or asking questions, I might just send out an email and say, would you like to pray for us and, and include on it um, to, for building our team, uh, the the startup team yeah so that was one of my ideas i was gonna say as well it sometimes it works in a surprise this stuff happens in a surprising way um years ago in a previous church way before antioch um i, I joined a worship team in, in my local church in leicester and there was this cliqueiness in that church which was quite a pain at the time and loads of people, including me, who went, were just not really feeling like part and parcel of the, of the congregation. But it just took one guy to say, well, you're going to come and practice with us sometime for our worship worship team. And I was like, yeah, that, that's all it took. So there are times when it can feel like if it's the other way around, you're the one who's trying to recruit people to a team of some kind, that it's like getting blood out of a stone. But... I do think there are times when when there's just people of goodwill around, like Julia said, might be somebody who's kind of a bit loosely connected but not really plugged in, that just asking a question rather than assuming, like not to say no for people before they've even had a chance to think about it, basically. Yeah, I mean, thus far in the diverse network, it's actually most of the recruitment has been done by through the network rather than through the team leader 
So we do, I mean, one of the things we'd really encourage you guys is just track with a network, track with a network. Um, you know, and if you're feeling kind of panicked or if you're feeling that you're really banging your head against a brick wall, then just get back to us and say, hey, look, um, not feeling it. What, you know, what can I do? Because I think as a network, we are so much stronger than we are just as a bunch of scattered individual church planters. Really so much stronger. So, yeah, I'd, I'd encourage you to stick close. I mean, let me, let me, let me just give you an example. So at the moment, we're, we're investigating a church plant into diverse church plant into Bolton. Now, the person who's actually kind of working on that is Lee. Say hi, Lee. There's Lee. Um, Lee and Melanie, nice to see you guys. Both of you. Um, but uh, obviously, Lee is working on his state side equally. Some of the stuff, some of the connections in Radcliffe came via diverse into his state. So there's, there's a real strength in the network. Um, you've got Sweetland, who's an estate church planter, doubling up, sidelining, moonlighting as a Tamil congregation gatherer. Um, where that much say hi to Sweetland. That's just a photo. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so again, we're much stronger as a network than we are just as individuals. We really do want to support and wire things across and get people into the right place there. I can, I mean, there's just so many examples. I can see Eamon Duggan, who joined us in Longsight, and I'll see Eamon, and has really kind of moved over to Rochdale and become a kind of kingpin of the Rochdale uh, Irish community. He runs drugs and guns. No, he doesn't run drugs. <laughs> <laughs> He's, uh, sorry, sorry, Eamon. Love you. Sorry, also, I'd like to apologize to, uh, to Dylan there as well. Um, uh, but just being a real kind of sort of kingpin, a, a kind of pillar of that, that Rochdale farm. And, you know, those are just examples of the way that the network is, um, is uh, you know, is very fruitful. So, you know, let's, let's keep doing that. Let's have a three minute break and then Wale is going to come and speak to us. Three minutes. Right, let's um, let's make a start, shall we? Um, well, they really good to have you with us. You have to unmute yourself. Bef so the the floor is yours, and maybe just introduce yourself as you start. So, and then over to you. Yeah, amazing. Okay, guys, if it's okay, I'm gonna pray first. Amazing. Yeah, Father Lord, we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for the privilege it is to co-labor with you with church planting, with seeing people discipled. And Father Lord, um, I just pray that you would just speak your heart, your narrative through me in the name of Jesus. And I just, yeah, I just pray for deep sensitivity. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, friends. My name is Wale, and it is so good to be with you guys. Honestly, I love the whole um, Antioch movement. I've been speaking to um, Ben and Amy over the last few years about it. And it's great to see Donna again. Ooh, I missed you. <laughs> yeah, so my name is Wale Ibadre and I am the leader of Imprint Church. I, we have plants in both London and in Leicester. And um, I'm currently living in London. I'm 25 years old. And I'm originally Nigerian, so that's just a bit about me. Um, and today I want to talk about building a core team. So really quickly, I would love us to take a look at the account in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And to basically, um, I know we have limited time, so I'm going to be speaking quite fast. So let me know if you want me to slow down. Um, I'm an extrovert, so I'll be known to speak quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me just give some context. So um, the king of Israel at the time, King Saul, he was doing detestable things in God's eyes. 
So the Lord basically said to Prophet Samuel that, okay, we are going to replace King Saul and I want you to anoint another king. So the Lord um, told Samuel to go to the house of Jesse and we can read on the story from there. So 1 Samuel 16, verse 6, it says, When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed here, it, um, stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Anibadab, and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then said to Shammah, um, Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There was still the youngest, Jesse answered, he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and he had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, raise and anoint him. This is the one. So for many of us that know the story, um, Prophet Samuel anointed David, which obviously through his lineage, um, that Jesus Christ, our Savior, came through. You know, I find these verses um, really interesting because Samuel was sent on assignment to anoint the next king. And my assumption is, especially reading this extract, that Samuel at first saw David's eldest brother. He saw his appearance, Elia. I thought, hmm, this is a good looking um, guy. He has maybe this king, kingly glow to him. He, his height, he has great stature. So obviously he is the king. And the Lord says to prophet Samuel, no, I have already rejected him. Perhaps the Lord has considered him, but he said, no, I have already rejected him. But the next few words in verse seven really strikes at me. The Lord says to Samuel, and he's teaching him something about his selection process. The Lord says, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. And you know, tonight we're talking about building a core team. So what are the things we look at when we're trying to build a core team? You know, um, obviously we look at people's experiences, maybe their qualifications, um, their time management, their preaching style, their charisma, Bible knowledge, their teamwork and skills and etc. And all of these things are good. They are, they are great virtues. But are these the things that God first looks at? Are these the first things that God looks at? And I feel like scripture actually tells us otherwise. I believe scripture is clearly telling us that God looks at the heart. And, you know, to be honest, it's hard to discern someone's heart posture without God's discernment and having a clear sensitivity. You know, especially um, with this um, story, if it wasn't for God, Samuel probably would have chosen Eliab. He probably thought, you know, Eliab is the right guy. He looks perfect on paper. But I actually believe that Eliab would have been a terrible king, full of pride. And even with um, the account of, of when the Israelites were fighting Goliath, Eliab probably would have had um, a deep cowardness towards him. And I just want to say and just um, just note that, you know, sometimes the most qualified person, the person that ticks all the boxes, that has great Bible knowledge, tons of experiences, um, that's a great communicator. And on top of that, maybe even, you know, supports the same football team as you. It's not always the person the Lord has anointed for the job. And in my experience, um, I've we started two church plants and I oversee those two church plants. In my experience, there's not been one individual in my core team that I've asked to be on my team that I have felt has been the most qualified um, <laughs> for the job. But, and some of them I honestly did not know well, but the fact is that the Lord highlighted them. And I'm just gonna be really honest with, with my process when selecting a core team. This is literally what I do. And some people think it's crazy, but this is what I do. I'll literally, I, I come to the Lord with no agenda, if I'm being honest. I don't, um, and I do believe it's important to ask the Lord, but honestly, it just comes out of an overflow of just of my relationship with God. Like sometimes when I'm going for a walk, the Lord gives me a prophetic vision 
of um, someone that could be a core team member and tells me, um, gives me a vision of um, them doing practical stuff and how they're operating and stuff. And sometimes the Lord gives me a dream about a person and I never, I never would have guessed it. I was like, God, you want this person to be my core team? Are you crazy? I, like, that would be the last person I would have chosen. And so it's not that bad. But like, for example, there's one person and it really took the grace of God. Like, so um, our logistics manager is my sister. And my sister, um, she's a part-time lawyer. She studied law. And it's great to have family on team, but it's also a nightmare. Like, I really love her. <laughs> but it's also a nightmare because my sister is my worst critic. And, and honestly, if it wasn't for God um, highlighting to me about my sister, she would not be on team, but she's honestly one of the biggest blessings. And she is just organized, organization and administrative, uh, administrative queen. And just like another story, I remember when someone walked into um, our church plant in London um, when we, yeah, when maybe we, we had been, um, we had been established for like at least um, four to six months. And the person walked in and very clearly, I just um, heard the Lord speak to me, just an inward witness where the Lord said to me, he's going to lead the men's ministry in this church. But the Lord told me that you are not to speak to him for six months about it. And I was like, okay, cool, no, <laughs> no worries. And um, one month later, he was still new to the community, still getting to know people. He, he came and asked me and he said, you know, Wale, I've just been thinking, I think it would be great to have, um, you know, a men's coffee morning where we can, um, you know, read the Bible together, have some accountability and pray for one another. And he was like, you know, do you know, do you think we could do such a thing? Literally offering it up, offering it as an idea. Um, and I said, yeah, sure. Um, why don't you lead the session? And he was like, are you serious? Are you sure you want me to lead? I was just offering the idea. I was like, no, honestly, why don't you lead the session? And he was incredible. Literally the week before he sent me a whole PDF document of the Bible study he's going to do, the questions that's contextual to our to our community and um, he brought so much food for the for the lads and stuff like that and obviously when the six months was up I asked him and I said you know would you like to join our core team um and and yeah lead this uh, men's ministry and he was already doing it but it was a surprise that you know he was like wow you actually asked me to join the core team and the Lord highlighted him just a really, and another example was a gentleman who I knew, but I didn't really know properly and was starting a new church plant. And this was our first one in Leicester. And he, like, I really did not know him properly. But I, again, just in prayer, um, the Lord showed me visions of him um, leading um, this, like, creative movement. And the Lord gave me this phrase where he called him the father of creatives. And bearing in mind, I didn't even know if he was a creative. I didn't know if he, <laughs> if he could do much in creativity and stuff. Um, but I just couldn't shake off the burden. And I spoke to him. I said, you know, I'm starting this new church plant. I told him the vision of our church plant. And um, as well, he was also a part of another church. And before I even spoke to him, because I was getting dreams about him, I spoke to the church leader who I had a good relationship with him. And I basically said, um, and to be honest, that church leader prophesied about me starting a church. But I spoke to that church leader and I, and I said, you know, the Lord has been giving me dreams about this particular guy in your congregation. Would, um, would you be comfortable with me speaking to him? And I was like, of course, take anyone you want. <laughs> Definitely. But when I actually um, spoke to him, um, he, he was honestly stunned and surprised. And he said, okay. Um, I will pray about it. And he prayed about it and he said, yes. Um, and it was only when he joined the community and started operating that I, that I found out he was a talented graphics designer. And he actually does, um, he's a digital designer for The Guardian. And I would never <laughs> have guessed. <laughs> I would never have guessed. And honestly, I just felt like I was taking such a huge risk because you know, at first glance, you know, this was someone who didn't have much church experience, who perhaps lacked some confidence, but, you know, it was someone that the Lord highlighted. Um, and that's, that's honestly, if I'm being honest, that's 
that's how it's been for all of um, the core teams for both parts. Our operations manager um, in, in Infant London is a 19 year old and he's, no, he's 20 now. And when the Lord first highlighted him and started um, giving me prophetic visions, I was very unsure. And I actually, <laughs> I actually thought the Lord quite hard. And I was like, God, no, you have to change your mind on this. Like, you know, honestly, I just felt like it was too young. I just felt like there wasn't much experience. But again, um, I, I, I knew that the Lord, <laughs> the Lord knows what to do. Like this is his church at the end of the day. He will build his own church. So I humbled myself and I spoke to him and the guy was like, yeah, like I'll give it a shot. And honestly, he is one of the most dependable and excellent leaders in our whole community. And he's trained up so many people. So the reason why I um, share all of those stories is because, you know, my prayer is that we'll be a group of planters that take risk on people that the Lord highlights and that we won't say no to the people that God doesn't say no to. And Jesus did this throughout his ministry. You know, even um, with Peter, where he says, I'll teach you to be fisher of men. You know, Peter um, became the apostle to the Jews and he started off as an erratic, you know, fisherman. Even with Barnabas, Barnabas vouched for um, Saul, who was a persecutor of Christians. And he became the apostle to the Gentiles and wrote the majority of the New Testament. And, you know, God doesn't need um, the people he sends to you to be finished pieces, but you as leaders of church plants, he, he needs you to be the type of people who are prophetically sensitive enough, patient and willing to cultivate the leaders that he sends to you to be everything he has called them to be. So those are just, so that's just a really quick uh, practicality. Another thing that I would like to share is that to throw out the nets, especially we, the Lord has been speaking to us about future church plants. So even in the Sunday service, we just ask people, you know, does anyone feel a call to um, this, to this location? And we do that to just see who the Lord has already been speaking to, to, to about it. And people actually admit like the Lord has been speaking for about this location, but I just didn't know what to do about it. And I was too um, fearful to actually talk about it. So sometimes, um, yeah, we can throw out the net. Um, one more practicality is to practice talking about it, um, talking about the vision, um, even share like the sermon process. When it came to um, our new plant, Infant London, we've just been going for, um, just over a year now, when it came to our new plants, um, especially those around me, especially my friends who uh, some of them um, joined the plant, they heard my discernment process. I invited them on the journey. They knew immediately when I was like, okay, I feel like the Lord might be calling us to London. You know, we were really um, vulnerable. And people saw the process, even when we didn't have a building, even when we didn't have a core team and stuff like that people saw the process. So it wasn't, it didn't take much energy to share the vision because they felt like they were part of it in the first place. Okay, so really quickly, I'm not sure how much time I have. Yeah, how much time do I have? Okay, cool. Okay, so um, really quickly, I would just like to share about um, core team culture. So this is perhaps you already have a core team or maybe you're still continually um, building a core team. I feel like these practicalities will just help to continue to have that culture where more people can be added to the core team. Okay, um, the first one is to not be a limiting factor. You know, church planters, I love church planters. I love them so much. Um, church planters have a huge capacity and um, church planters often specialize in many different fields, in many different fields. I remember um, visiting a church plant and we're going a baptism hall and I had my intern um, with me and um, the operations manager at the time, he, he gave me the baptism hall and I was like, oh, how do you set it up? And he had no idea how to set it up. But then uh, the, the church planter came down, the local vicar came down and was like, hey, Wale, oh, this is how you set it up and stuff like that. And I said to, to my intern, that's a real church planter. <laughs> like, there's just things that a church planter knows. Like, a church planter could be great at communicating and um, Bible study and stuff, but at the same time might have, like, the technical skills and media and stuff. 
And it's because there is a need to kind of like um, have that overview just because um, you're literally building from the ground up. But the issues with church planters is that because they are talented or have to learn so many different fields and to be specialized in so many different fields, they can be a limiting factor where other people do not get involved. And this honestly happened to me where um, I had to learn different fields and it got to a point, especially in our um, in the early days of our church plant, I was the only person who knew how to set up a PA system. Um, at the same time, I was the person that was preaching. So, you know, I'll set up the PA system and I'll preach and stuff. Um, and it got to a point where um, someone in my core team said, oh, well, like, can I help you? And I was like, oh, don't worry, let me just do it. It was, it was too, it will take me too long to teach someone else how to do it. And he stopped me and he actually said, you know, Wale, it's ridiculous that you're the only person in this church that knows how to set this up. And that hit me because I realized that I became a limiting factor in this community. And, you know, maybe there's things that um, in your context where maybe someone else can attach that to your name, that you are the only person that knows how to do this in this church. You've become a limiting factor where essentially if you are taken out, then God knows what could happen. And and that really, and that really just frightened me, and in, in, it, it just gave me that holy fear. And even, even with a core team, a core team can become a limiting factor as well, where you have such a diverse team that specialises in different fields, but because they're so talented and so specialised, the congregation feel like they can't get involved. And again, this was something that was happening in our community. And I basically said, success does not look like us finishing the task. Success from now on looks like how many people we included in the process. So now, like our core leaders are very intentional to include people and to train up people, even if it takes up longer. But even if it takes longer, because you know, training up people takes up more time sometimes than you doing it in yourself, but that's long-term fruit. And the reason why um, this was a burden in my heart, if I can just share a little story. It's because when I was a young person, when I was a teenager, I had incredible leaders and they were amazing, but they um, felt a call to move abroad and to start a church abroad. And, you know, we honored them, we blessed them. But honestly, when they left, the, the youth group crumbled. And, and still to this, um, and to, this, um, to this day, there's some people who were... Um, who love the Lord, who are no longer walking with the Lord just because, you know, their, their main shepherds walked out. And it taught me something as a teenager that um, it's possible to lead people just to yourself um, or to build up something in such a way that's only dependent on you. And I remember as a youth vouching to the Lord that if you ever cause me to lead something, I'll build it in such a way where it doesn't revolve around me where it only stands upon me because, you know, sometimes things happen to church, uh, church planters. Sometimes things where you get burnt out, where you just need to relax. So sometimes you are called elsewhere. What's going to happen to the church plant? You know, um, I love what Ben shared. You know, we are trying to build sustainable church plants, not, not church plants that um, all of a sudden collapse because something happened to one individual. And maybe this might not even happen to just a church plant, but let's just think of ministry areas. If you're the only person that's leading worship, that's praying, that's doing the technical stuff, and God forbid something happens to you, then it means that you need to train up more people in that area. You know, yesterday there was a young lady um, that spoke in our church. Everyone applauded her. She did an incredible job. But during the week, she said, and well, like, could you sit down with me to go through my talk and stuff? And, you know, I sat down with her, we corrected some stuff, really shared, really um, helped her to, to, to steward the revelation that the Lord was saying to her, helping her to find more language. And it took some time, but that's investing in people. And in the long run, she, she, she is already a, a phenomenal communicator. But that just means that we are releasing more laborers. So releasing more laborers means that we have to take time with people. Okay. I have um, a few more minutes left. Um, and the next, the last thing that I would like to share is um, be a collaborative leader. 
So um, what I mean by this, some people uh, think this is um, democratic. I do believe in some aspects, you know, we have to be democratic. I think in some aspects, we also have to be very directive as well. But what I mean by being a collaborative leader is tailor, um, um, lead in such a way that tailors to everyone's giftings. So for example, um, you know, we had a um, situation where in our community, we felt prophetically that the Lord was, like in a particular season, the Lord was just going to send a whole group of people to us uh, spontaneously. It was summertime and we just felt like, yeah, the Lord is going to send a whole group of people to us. And it actually did happen. So we said, okay, um, per, um, if this is the prophetic word, we, our small groups need to be ready. And right now we don't have enough small group and small group leaders. So we needed to, so we needed to like reshape all of our small groups and stuff and maybe break up some small groups to make more space for people. So um, that was what like the, you know, the, uh, the prophetic people in our community brought. And then we're like, okay, um, if this is what the Lord is saying, then um, how can we, um, actually implement this in a practical way that still that's still sensitive to people's needs because people have formed relationships and stuff so we ask the people in our community in our core team who have that pastoral grace who have the heart of a shepherd that if we um change up the small groups we need to but what's the best way we can do it that still honors people's relationships and stuff and that's something that we did where we get different voices in mind, where we ask, okay, what are the prophetic voices? What are the prophetic voices? How can we biblically teach about expansion in such a way and stuff? And we do this because it gives a overarching overview um, to our community and just like a strength um, to our community. And that just means that um, the core team members feel honored. The core team members feel like, wow, well, these, like the leader is actively listening to me and is actually seeing my point of view and is trying to involve me in the discernment. Amazing. So yeah, I'm going to leave it there for the sake of time. But yeah, thank you for listening. Sorry for talking so fast. No, don't be daft. Thank you so much, Wally. Um, inspiring, really inspiring. And, and, and we've known Wally for a little while and... and um, most of your most of the people that do stuff in your church while they are they paid or unpaid and they're all unpaid yeah this is what excites me about Wally's church none of his people are paid like this his church planting method is based on the fact that we're doing this because we're called to do it um and it, yeah and and also it's very it's as you've heard for yourself um that releasing culture and um, it's just yeah so thank you so much, Wally. You put some questions out. We're going to go into breakout rooms um, and do some questions, around, uh, do some answers around the questions, but also think about action planning. What next? What do you need to put into place um, from here? Um, Wally is going to be put in randomly to a breakout room as well. So if you're that, that, that group, you're lucky. Sorry to everyone else. So um, discuss amongst yourselves. And if you're in Wally's group, ask him some questions as well. Um, so yeah, go and we'll come back from this at 9.20. So we've got a good 25 minutes. Great. Thanks, Pete. So we're going to finish. You, you may have remembered that it's Lent. I'm hoping you do know that you're in the second week of Lent. Um, and so it, we're going we're gonna to say the last two verses of Psalm 139. And we're just going to say it, keep, keep yourself muted, just in a moment we'll say it to ourselves and then we'll just have some silence for the Holy Spirit to do his work um, in, these, in these two last verses. I mean, the whole psalm is obviously astonishing, but th these two verses I think are particularly good, um, at, particularly at this time of Lent. So we'll say this in a moment and have some silence and then we'll, we'll worship. So let's say this together. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting.
Holy Spirit, come and fill us afresh. Apart from you, Lord Jesus, we can do nothing. And as we think about the task of planting church, of recruiting team, it's too big for us, Lord. For nothing's impossible for you, Jesus. And it's you who builds your church. So we give our all back to you, Lord. Where we've come off the altar, Lord, help us to get back on, Jesus. Where we've made it about us, consciously or subconsciously, Lord. We step out of the centre. Jesus, we need you. Holy Spirit, come and help us. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Cool. Um, a massive thanks to Wally. Um, it's so good to have you with us, brother. Um, inspiring and really good to have you with us. And hopefully we'll see you at some point as well. Once we're out of this lockdown, June 21st, possibly. Um, great to see everyone. Loads of love. The next one is the 15th, I think. Is that right, Pete? 15th of, of March? I think something like that. So see you soon. Have a good few weeks. Oh, bye, everyone. God bless. Bye. 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 Yeah, God bless. Bye. 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 God bless you all. Bye. Yeah.